Very good, Sienna. Yes, so on page what? Where, who said 21? Yes, very good. So on 21, actually, the new paragraph there. But if you look, I think perhaps the most accurate rendition of what you said, Siana, is on 2, 4, from the bottom of the page, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 lines from the bottom, where he says, the scattered families that live at 8 or 10 miles distance from the nearest of them must learn to perform themselves a great number of little pieces of work for which in the more populous countries, more populous countries, they would call in the assistance of those workmen, those specialized workmen. Country workmen are almost everywhere obliged to apply themselves to all different branches of industry that have so much affinity to one another as to be employed about the same sort of materials. So, essentially, he's saying that where you have a more dense population, there's going to be more demand. Makes sense, right? So, population. What else determines demand? The extent of demand. The extent of the market. Yes. Water carriage. Why? (laughs) To ask for the movement of goods. If If there's a way for me to get living in Oakland to have goods that arrive from Panama by water, then that extends the market. If I have no access to those goods, then, of course, it... Demand is not going to be, it's going to be very limited. So if people in Panama want things in Oakland, and people in Oakland want things in Panama, it extends the market. Um, so transportation, transportation in Smith's time, water transportation is very important. And that is what he says indeed, the division of labor, in as much as it depends upon exchange, and exchange depends upon transportation, and transportation is about water, means that division of labor develops most where? On the coast in ports, right, near rivers, along rivers. Exactly right. Exactly right. And there is one other feature of demand. What else does he say that shapes demand? Sounds rather obvious too. He talks about wealth, actually. If you look on page 23, and if you look on two from the bottom of the page, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen lines from the bottom, or fourteen lines from the bottom, he says it's three words in from the left. The extent of their market, therefore, must for a long time be in proportion to the riches and populousness of that country, and consequently their improvement must always be proscript to the improvement of that country. Okay, so wealth and populousness. These are the factors that shape the the real possibility of development of division of labor. Where there is supply and demand, an extensive market, the propensity to drop margin exchange is realized in a more intense and more developed division of labor. The extension of the market, therefore, depends and thus shapes and makes possible division of labor and depends upon the extent of supply and demand. And he has that story about the porter. There's no use for a porter in the countryside, but in the city, where the population is more dense, there is much more demand for porters, and therefore we can have somebody like a porter, a specialized porter. So, those are the conditions of development of division of labor, namely supply and demand, the extent of the market. Very good. That is point number three. Whoa. Now we get to the fun part. The consequences of division of labor for the individual. Well, we've been assuming this all along. First of all, the consequences have already said on page 19 to 20, the consequences of division of labor are what? Are what? The consequences for the individual first and foremost as the development of their... Self-interest is just assumed. But division of labor makes us different. Develops our talents. Develops our talents. Develops our talents. Develops our talents. The division of labor puts us into different places, and in different places we develop different talents. That's what we've already said on page 19 to 20. But the division of labor does something else to us. When we specialize, what happens, Chelsea? It improves, improves our dexterity. What else does it do? It saves time. What else does it do? Yes. Makes you what, sorry? Ignorant. Ah! Okay. 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 First, it increases productivity. What do we mean to increase productivity? For the same amount of energy, we produce more things if we specialize. Why? Because we get more dexterous. If we specialize on putting pinheads on pins, we get really dexterous. That's how we start doing it in our sleep. Dexterous. We also save time. Why do we save time? Because we don't move from job to job, like those agricultural workers who saunter from sowing seeds to plowing to milking cows, and they wander all over the place, according to Smith, smoking their pipe, gossiping and drinking. That's his vision of agriculture. Yes, so the manufacturing worker, however, saves time by focusing on a job that is done repetitively. Yes, but there's another third reason why we have productivity the Division of Labor gives us. Yes. We make machines. We are what? We do what? We engage in... What's the third feature he says? Yes? Inventions. We are innovative. We are inventors. Because we are so focused on our task, because we are specialized, we invent new ways of doing inventiveness. It increases our inventiveness. Okay? And those three factors contribute to what? Increased productivity. So, 
This division of labor it leads to increased productivity, which of course leads to that wealth. Now, very good. All right, all right, all right. Now, somebody at the back, where were you? Somewhere you're hiding from me. Who said, I was, yes, it was. What's your name? Dapri. 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 I can't hear. What's, how do you spell it? Sorry, N A B P R what? N A B P R D E T. How do you pronounce that? Shh. Napreet. Napreet. Okay, well, I better leave that there. Napreet. Okay, yes, Napreet, right. Now, you said something very, very important. I'm talking about on page 302. On page 302, it talks about. So where are we exactly? The last paragraph on 302. <coughs> I'm going to start third line from the bottom. Conrad. The man whose life is spent in performing a few simple operations of which the effects too are perhaps always the same or very nearly the same has no occasion to exert his understanding or to exercise his invention in finding out ex- experience for removing difficulties which never occurred. Go on. He naturally loses. Therefore, the habit of such, such exertion in general becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for human creatures to become. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> the torpor of his mind renders him not only incapable of relishing or bearing a part in any rational conversation, but of conceiving any generous, noble, or tender sentiment, and conceiving of conceiving any gener- oh, sorry. consequently of forming a judgment concerning any even of the ordinary duties of private life. Right. Stupefication. That's not private said. Yes, stupefication. Stupefication. Well, what do you think? Is there a contradiction here? What's the contradiction? Jason. Yes, these two seem to be contradictory. On the one hand, he's saying that people concentrate on becoming imaginative and creative and innovative. And on the other hand, they become stupefied, ignorant and stupid. Yes? Well, he does say that there are philosophers who do invention, but he also says on page, we should get this straight, where are we? Where has somebody helped me? Page, I could actually, four, 11 to 14, 11 to 14, third point. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. All right, on page 11. Um, that's, and this is a summary of it, but the second, new, the first new paragraph on page 11, indented there, this great increase in the quantity of work, which in consequence of the division of labor, the same number of people are capable of performing, is owing to three different circumstances. First, to the increase of dexterity in every particular workman. Secondly, to the saving of work time, which is commonly lost in passing from one species of work to another. And lastly, to the invention of a great number of machines, which facilitate and abridge labor, enable one man to do the work of many. So then we should turn to page 13. And then if we turn to page 13 from, top, from the top of the page, 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10 lines from the top. Siana, what does he say? Yeah. What does he say on page 13, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 lines from the top? Um, uh, page 13, 3, 6, 9, 10 lines from the top, three words in from the left. About men are much more likely to discover yep. the and readier method of attaining any object when the whole attention of their mind is directed towards that single object than when it is dissipated in a whole variety of things. Go on. Keep going? Yep. But in the consequence, consequence of the division of labor, the whole of every man's attention comes naturally to be directed towards the Thank you very much. So that is his claim there, at least, right? Yeah? Right? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that was your point, right? So he is making that claim that by specializing, we focus on a, on a particular object and therefore we become inventive. Now, Kristen, you had your hand up too. Uh, again, I don't think they're in direct uh, ah. predictions. Ah! Um, page 303. 303. The line is pretty the same, I think it kind of sums up what you're saying in terms of uh-huh. It's, uh huh. It's uh. What's from the breaking paragraphs? His dexterity. Yeah. Read it, please. His dexterity and his own particular trait seems, in this manner, to be acquired at the expense of his intellectual, social, and martial vast virtues. So it's not just that he's being stupid; it's that he's being stupid in a social sense and an intellectual and other senses. His dexterity at his own particular trait seems, in this manner, to be acquired at the expense of his intellectual, social, and martial virtues. What are you saying here? There is a contradiction on the face of it, on the face of it, between the idea of stupefaction on the one side and, uh, hold on, and, and inventiveness on the other. But you're saying there's a way of resolving this apparent contradiction. And how is it you have resolved it? That, um, in the, through this sentence. That, the stupefaction applies to everything but that one singular thing that that person is doing. So this is an excellent thing. 
Yes, indeed. This stupefaction refers to what? In this sentence, it seems. Well, 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 concretely, what does he say again? He says, he says, intellectual, social, and martial virtues. So outside the workplace, outside the workplace, he is, or she is, stupefied. But in the workplace, there is still imagination. So he's able to hold on to both. He says, yes, inventiveness at the workplace. New machines because of the focus. But... He is, or she is, the worker is so obsessed, so focused, that he becomes, or she becomes so ignorant of the world around, so oblivious to the world around, loses any sense of that world, loses all those martial virtues, the capacity to be a citizen. And so, he argues, basically, government must do what? Public education. Public education. So that's one way of resolving. Very good. Excellent. BB. BB is always, if you resolve a contradiction, then you get a BB. Uh, uh, so, yes, basically that's one way of saying it. That, in that inventiveness really still applies to the workplace, but what he's talking about is stupefaction outside the workplace as a result of this specialization. Excellent. But there's another way of resolving this contradiction. That perhaps you will not be able to find the text, but perhaps we can nevertheless suggest. This is a way in a sense of different spheres of life. Basically, there are different spheres. There's work sphere and non-work sphere. Now, what else? How, other, how else might we resolve this contradiction? Yes, Jessica. I kind of feel like the stupefaction is a result of their inventiveness. I don't know if that's... Ah! Like, they are, they try to simplify everything. And it becomes this point where it's, it's, I would have to make, like... Waffle on my own, it's difficult. Whereas we simplified it by having waffle machines, or I don't know how to like. Yes, but all right, so you invent the machine, and then you become, in a sense, subject to that machine and become stupefied. Very good. Now, you have resolved the contradiction, not in a sense geographically or spatially, as Kristen does, but temporally. <laughs> in the beginning, we are creative, and then there comes a time when we become stupefied. So that's another way that, uh, that in the beginning, perhaps, when things are new, we become creative, and then we become stupefied. That is the way that we can resolve that contradiction. Now, we have not talked about, and I've got 45 seconds left, we have not talked about, we've talked about the consequences for the individual. The consequences of the individual are increased productivity through dexterity, saving time, and inventiveness. And we've handled this problem of stupefaction, though recognized it. Now, that's, con- that's the consequence of the individual. What we haven't talked about is the most fundamental consequence, and that is the consequence for society as a whole. And what in a nutshell, and what in a nutshell is the consequence of the division of labor for society as a whole? Hands up. Matthew? Um, Yes, a uni- what do you want? He says universal opulence that will trickle down to the lower ranks of society. But there's a proviso there. Did anybody pick up the proviso in that sentence? The proviso. The proviso. The qualification in the sentence. In a, in a, in a. You're not going until you got this. No, not civil society. Yes, hands up. Matthew, in a well-governed society. Does he tell us what a well-governed society is? No. (laughs) So, we have to examine this very carefully. That's what you will do over the weekend. And then we will build up Smith's whole theory, and we will ransack it, and then we'll move into Marx and Engels. Have an enjoyable weekend on the beach with Marx and Engels. (laughs) Shoot.